All right, everybody, welcome to the Virginia Western CS Scholars. Uh, this is Scholars number three, I believe. Um, so we're really happy to have you all here to join us today. Um, for those of you that have been here before, you know the deal. Please turn off your microphones and cameras. Um, unlike in class, I don't want to have to chase you down later to get permission for having your image on the screen. So it's just easier for me if you'll turn them off now. I will be accepting questions in the chat screen. Please. Uh, Give, a, give us a lot of really great, highly technical, very, very detailed questions. Rob was yeah. telling you earlier how he really wanted you guys to work hard to stump him today. Um, <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> um, and before we get started with everything, I do want to introduce a few people. We have Diane Wolf here and we have Amy White, our Dean of STEM. Amy, do you have anything to say today for us? Briefly, B, I will say hello to everybody. Um, thank you so much to Rob for being here tonight and guiding this discussion. And thank you to the students for recognizing this uh, awesome opportunity. We're taking time out of your busy schedules to um, learn with us. And uh, that's the fun part of being at school is that we can all learn together. And uh, I want to shout out also to your, to your instructional team, B. Bagby, Jeff Scott, and Diane Wolf. It is said that it takes a village uh, to do most anything significant. And, and you ITCS folks have a amazing village behind you and they do so much to support you and uh, i just encourage you to keep engaging with them keep engaging with the folks they introduce you to and we will uh sit back and enjoy the show as i said earlier <laughs> well I, I fear if it takes a village that that may make me the village idiot so i'm, I'm there not, that's okay <laughs> but, uh, we all need them the only quick comment i have is students don't forget today is the first day of registration for spring Yes. Go out there and get registered. Yeah, go out there and register for Python and uh, basically anything I teach. Avoid the Java classes. Everybody knows you don't need those anymore. Uh. <laughs> right. That's good. I don't have to work hard. I love it. Correct. I, I, I agree with you, B. That's yes. <laughs> right, go to Python. Cut them off. like Python. Okay, thank y'all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there may be a little bit of animosity between Dr. Wolf and I on programming languages. Uh, uh, friendly <laughs> competition. <laughs> I do want to, uh, to introduce you to Robert Garvey. Uh, Rob Garvey is a network security engineer working at the Carilion Clinic for Information Security Department uh, in Roanoke, Virginia. Robert is responsible for forming threat analysis, network assessment, and compliance auditing for the enterprise network systems located in various locations scattered across Virginia. He has more than 25 years of experience in information technology. During that time, he has held positions in information security, information technology, and industrial security. Rob is also the founder of the Roanoke Information Security Exchange, also known as RISE. Robert has been asked to present to both local leaders and community service groups. Also, Robert has uh, provided commentary for features and articles for the Roanoke Times and WSLS News 10 in Roanoke, Virginia. And I can tell you, I am personally super excited. I'm going to give myself a plug using Rob's name. Uh, we've got our first uh, health information technology class that is opening up. Hey, you can register for it today, HIT 230 will be offered in the spring. Um, and so I'm really excited to have somebody here to give us to give us a firsthand accounting. Rob is going to talk to us about healthcare information technology. So Rob, it's all yours. Thank you. So uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, I'm doing the IT and healthcare presentation this evening. And I was talking to B earlier, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, one thing I will say before I even get started, uh, I my presentation is probably not going to have a lot of content in the way of like a lot of words on the screen, a lot of pictures, because, you know, I like to keep it somewhat simple. So uh, you're probably going to want to, if possible, if you can kind of pull me up a little bit more than maybe the presentation, because the presentation may not have a lot of content, but I will, because that's kind of how I roll. So but anyway, so let's get started. So I'm doing the IT and healthcare, and uh, I begin to kind of when I first took this on, I said, sure, yeah, I can do this, no problem, because I work in healthcare and I work in IT. And then I began to realize, no, I'm a network security engineer who happens to work in IT. And so when I had to kind of expand my thought process a little bit, when I began to look at IT and healthcare as a whole arena. So this was a learning experience for me as much as it is will be for you, but what I found was that, man, this is, this is a huge, broad topic. 
I mean, man, this thing goes all over the place. And so I entitled this Buckle Up Buttercup because we're going to go fast and we're going to hit a lot of things and we're going to skim the surface. But if along the way you decide, man, you know, I really would really wish we would have talked about this more or maybe we could have done something else. Uh, we'll, I'll have my contact information there available at the end of the presentation so we can chat about that. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So there'll be an opportunity for us to converse about whatever topics that you want in the IT healthcare arena. But with that, I, uh, I do want to add in a disclaimer. Uh, the views and opinions are mine. So if I screw up and I say the wrong thing, please do not hold Carillion responsible or rise. Uh, this is Robology 101. Everything here is in my head, in my brain. So that means that uh, you're getting what's here, so good luck, and uh, we'll just move on from there. So, with that being said, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with a story. So we all have that one family member, right? That one family member that when you get together, you know there's gonna be trouble. So for me, that was Cousin Ronnie. Cousin Ronnie was about my age, and so they would let, uh, and as I was growing up, I go by Rob today, but back then it was Robbie. So literally it was Robbie and Ronnie. And we got together, they let us get together about once a quarter, because when they did, when our parents let us get together, it was gonna be trouble. And so uh, my grandmother lived in a little town called Slapout, Alabama. And Slapout, Alabama is actually, it's, it's been renamed, I think, to Hoytville, Alabama now, not that that's much better. But it's about 4,000 people strong, about a, maybe an hour, an hour south of Birmingham, maybe 30 minutes north of, of Montgomery. And so my grandmother had this plot of land out there. And my cousin could bring his motorcycle every time we got to visit. So we, my mother and I would drive down from Lynchburg, Virginia. My cousin was in a neighboring town in Alabama. He would bring his motorcycle in the back of his dad's pickup, and we would meet. And we would have great fun, and we would get to ride the motorcycles and do all kinds of stuff, play in the woods and do all these crazy things. And so one summer, we had this fantastic idea. So we started off and we said, you know, you've got the motorcycle. And your little brother brought his big wheel. And I think I know where we can get some ski rope. So you can see where this is going, and it's not a great idea, but I will tell you one thing. One and one equals fun. And we had a blast. I was pulling him with, we had this long ski rope hooked to the big wheel and I'm pulling him. And, and so I'd ride the big wheel and he'd pull me and we had all this great fun and it was fantastic until it wasn't. So what happened was I'm driving along and we're jumping ramps and we're jumping little hills in the yard. We're just having a great time. And then as I'm looking behind me, watching him, I didn't see the flower garden. My grandmother had a huge flower garden in the middle of her front yard. And this thing was like a foot deep. And so I'm looking back, I run into the flower garden, taking out the azaleas, taking out the rose bushes, the tulips, whatever else was in there. And that was, okay until I hit the other side of the flower garden. Now it's about a foot tall, like I said, so the motorcycle flips over, I flip off, the big wheel's in the air, all of these crazy things are happening, and the motorcycle ends up flat on me. So it's burning my leg, it's, all, it's, it's a bad situation, so obviously I end up at the hospital. So I'm at the hospital, and the doctor is looking at me, evaluates me, does what he needs to, I bandage me up, I get my crutches, and I'm walking out the door. So my mother's got all the paperwork and everything, and as we're leaving, we see my grandmother's van parked in the parking lot. And we didn't have cell phones back then, so we're like, well, what the heck's grandma doing here? So we walk, start walking over to the van, and as we get closer, we realize that there's medical staff around the back of the van. So, Literally, while I'm at the hospital getting my leg repaired, my cousin has gone off into the dry lake bed and started trying to do some more jumps and ramps and ended up breaking his collarbone. So now he's in the hospital. Now he's in the emergency room that I just left. 
So nonetheless, it's easy to, it's easy to figure out that uh, it cratered out our time together during that week. We didn't do a whole lot. We didn't have like Nintendo or anything because I'm in, I'm in a cast and he's in a sling. And so I don't really remember what we did, but it was something to the equivalent of just watching TV or watching cartoons or something. So I tell you that story and you're like, well, cool story, bro, but what's that got to do with IT and healthcare? Well, the reason why I tell you the story is because it's a great place to start. It's a fantastic place to start. Because this was probably in the late 70s, maybe mid 70s, depending. And what I was thinking about was, and I'm gonna say it, back when I was a kid, we didn't have no stinking computers in the doctor's office, right? All we had was dirt, and we was thankful for that dirt. But the point is, is that we didn't have computers in the doctor's office. And there were paper records. So literally, when my uncle's dealing with my cousin, and he's taking, and we get done, we're having these paper records that the doctor gives us. And he says, OK, take these records to your doctor back at your house or to your hometown, and we're going to, then you're going to use these records to work on your getting well portion, right? So the doctors are going to work with you, but you have to take on these records so that they know what you're doing. And we had manual billing, and if you, like, my mom had to pay, it was the credit card on the, the old, you know, slide credit card machine. And if you don't know what that is, then talk to one of the elder adults in the room, I guess. But uh, that's how we did it back then. We didn't have computers. And if you did have computers, maybe you were in a larger office, maybe you were in a larger medical office, you had these point systems they were designed specifically for one thing maybe you had a word processor or maybe you had a system just for accounting and if you wanted to share data between these systems it was like sneaker net what we call sneaker net. you had these eight inch floppies man and you take it out of that machine and you'd walk it over and you put it in this other machine and then that's how you shared your data it was really inefficient but that's all we had man so then something amazing happened Something phenomenal happened. Something that was just the best in the world. It was called the 80s. The 80s, man. The 80s gave us David Hasselhoff, the mullet, hair metal, Atari 2600, Thundercats, Max Headroom, and my favorite movie, War Games. All of these things happened in the 80s. And all of a sudden, we start seeing changes occur in the computing industry. From a business operations side, we start seeing the IBM PC and Microsoft DOS. Bill Gates is on the scene now. And then we're starting to see these strange network kind of things starting to build out. We've got this thing called Banyan Vines. Or maybe you got DEC networks, VAX networks, mainframes. And then we got these cool things called modems, 2600 baud, man. Man, we're able to make things called bulletin boards. And if you know what a bulletin board is, it's like the internet before it was the internet. And you would like stand up these things, your computer went home. And so people would dial into your home and you would have a billboard, a bulletin board, but maybe it has games on it or maybe it has information on it or whatever. But people had different bulletin boards that they would dial into. And this is what's happening in the, in the 80s, right? We're starting to see these things start to take place. And then what else are we starting to see? On the medical front, we're seeing something called clinical engineering. At least that's what we call it here at Carillion. We start to see the clinical engineering start to take effect. And these are patient-focused devices specifically designed just for taking care of patients. We're not sharing data. But maybe it's an ultrasound machine. Maybe it's a heart monitor. Maybe it's something, but it's always custom designed for the purpose that it's built for. And there's these computer boards and tons of soldering. And, and you need to make sure that, uh, that when you're building these things, that, that you're purposely building them just for the, the thing that they're doing for the patient. And we're not really, it's, it's not like an IBM clone. Everything is point in time just for that particular purpose. And there was always the one guy that you wanted to, you needed this one guy to be able to, to assist you. And that guy that you always wanted to know, but never wanted to actually admit that you knew, was the computer guy. And the computer guy was the guy who knew how all of this stuff worked. But you never really wanted to say that you knew that guy, but 
you actually wanted to know this guy because he was the guy that actually understood everything. And so he's not the guy you'd want to invite to a party, but he's, he's, you wanted him to be your buddy. So as we continue to progress, things move forward. And now Ethernet becomes a standard. And we have these things called LANs and WANs. And now we can communicate within our own organization. Sometimes we can communicate across the county. And we've got Microsoft Windows now. Microsoft Windows has now got NT351, maybe NT40. So as we're continuing to make these advancements, we're moving forward. And then again, something else occurs in the medical world. HIPAA becomes law. In 1996, President Clinton signed into law the HIPAA law. And part of this law was the electronic medical record statement, which basically said, we got to move all of these paper medical records to electronic medical records. Now, why is that so important? Why do we care about that? Well, because even back in 96, we understood that we can't continue to do things on paper. We need to move forward. We need to make a change so that we can better store these records and be able to better share these records. But there was a problem. That's expensive, and not everybody was on board. So we continue to get push from our leaders. And we have President Bush saying, we need to have our medical records put on the IT. And while the vernacular is really bad, what he says is true. We need to make, we need to try to figure out how can we put these things onto the IT. How can we get these things electronic so that we can begin to share data and also billing's a little bit simpler and we're able to communicate and there's a lot of different advancements that we can do out of that. So in 2009, Obama signs high tech and what high tech does is that it provides incentives for those that want to move forward with the electronic medical records. So if you're willing to to meet or exceed the guidelines, then we're gonna give you incentives. But for those of you that don't, well now you're gonna incur penalties. So now we're forcing you into this electronic medical record thing. So what does that mean to us? Well, now all of a sudden, we're having to make advancements. Again, we're pushing forward into the data center. Now we have to have data centers. And now we need Things like we're, we're going to have to have these huge data stores and SQL databases and all these different things, electronic medical record systems. And we all of a sudden, things are moving really quickly. And then the Internet. Now we can share data. It's not, it's not bulletin boards anymore. No, nope. now we've got the Internet where we can share data, pull data down. We can do all these crazy things. And then we get the, this crazy thing called the cloud. And nobody really knows what the cloud is. We just know that our senior management team really wants to get to the cloud. They don't really understand what it is either. It looks eerily familiar to what we did back in the 70s with this whole mainframe thing, but we're not talking about that. We just know we want to get to the cloud, right? So all of a sudden, this guy's not cutting it anymore. We need something better than just this guy. We need something with better structure. We need something that actually can handle the load, and that is the IT department. So the IT department, now we've got structure, now we've got people, now we've got a, a call center that can push initiatives and do things. And what's so important about the IT department is that this is where your story begins. If you're a new student and you're looking to get into this healthcare arena from an IT perspective, this is your story. This is where you begin your journey. If you're somebody that's moving from one health, uh, moving from one career field into another, and you're looking, how do I move forward? This is your story. This is where you get your start in the IT department. And so now we now we have a structured department to be able to handle these things because the lines are beginning to blur. We no longer just have clinical engineering and business operations. Now all of a sudden things are starting to blur, particularly because of the electronic medical record. Because now we have network medical devices. Network medical devices allow us to be able to, to take data that's from a medical device, and rather than getting the data and handwriting it into a paper record and then storing that, now we can take that data directly from the medical device and insert it right into the medical record. And now we have the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things allows us to be able to take data that's maybe not, um, maybe not 
going directly from a medical device within the perimeter, now we can expand beyond the perimeter. Now we can go directly from the devices that you have to the cloud, and then it's consumed in the cloud by your provider. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But then we also have telemedicine. Telemedicine allows us, particularly with this COVID, allows us to be able to visit our provider anywhere. And it's just not about being able to visit your provider in your hometown. Let me give you an example. I'm going to camp out here on this telemedicine thing for just a second. So let's talk about how telemedicine can change the landscape of healthcare. So I'm in a small town. As I drive through, as I'm going to Washington or whatever, I might drive through a small town. And I see, in our particular case, I see a small provider, a small Carilion family practice medicine that's in the middle of nowhere. And I see that, I think to myself, how do we support that small one or you know, four room establishment? Maybe they have one doctor there. Maybe they have two at the most. Maybe they have a meg and a half network connection. How are we going to get them what they need? And the answer that we've been able to provide back to that, the answer that we have to that is telemedicine. So imagine you are a patient with a cardiac situation. You, have, you need a heart doctor. Now, obviously, the small town doesn't have the, the best heart doctor in town. Maybe they do. Maybe they're fortunate. But chances are probably not. So what that's going to do is that now we can actually move forward and you can actually go to the provider there. And while you're there, we have devices that allow that cardiologist in Roanoke to be able to see the EKG or maybe the heart, maybe the lungs or whatever. And he's getting that data in real time so that he can make a decision exactly as he can make that decision about your best care path directly as a result of what you're getting from the telemedicine transfer. So, and now here's where it gets really crazy. You're not limited just to Roanoke. If you need the best cardiologist in the world, telemedicine allows that to occur. You can visit with any doctor. It doesn't have to be a doctor in a neighboring county, a neighboring city, a neighboring t town. It can be anywhere in the world. That's what telemedicine gets us. And it goes beyond just that. This is a Da Vinci system. And we are actually using these today. These are in practice at many hospitals today. And this is a really unique feature that we are that you can actually have the doctor sitting in one station and the robot actually performs the surgery for you and these are actually in use today the da vinci systems and so it's not uncommon to have a doctor sitting in one room and the operation taking place in another room as that doctor is controlling the da vinci robot so now let's take that a little bit further i need the best cardiologist in the world to fix my heart that's not a problem. He sits in his station over here. The robot does the surgery all the way across the world. And so how does all that occur? That's IT. That's all IT. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but where are we going? Everybody has wearable medical devices these days, right? So everybody has a Fitbit or an iPhone on their, on their wrist. And who's the consumer of that data? So we're sending, these, we're sending this information up, and everybody has Apple. Maybe uh, if, if you've got Apple monitoring your EKG or your O2, these kinds of things, Apple now becomes your health provider. Never really thought about it, right? Apple is now a health provider because they're providing you feedback based on the medical information that they're getting from you. And now we take it one step further. Perhaps you have a pacemaker that's implanted in you. And now that information is now streamed from your phone into the cloud so that the cardiologist can take a look at that information in your medical record and in whatever platform that he needs to to make 
conscious decisions about you at any given time. And you can also take part in those medical decisions because you're seeing that data as well. And if you want to, you can also distribute that information to other providers around the world, including Apple or anybody else. Now let's take it one step further. As we continue to move forward in healthcare and IT, we're gonna expect the AI to continue to take a deeper dive into where we're going. So imagine a world where you walk into the doctor's office and you simply give them your, you tell them what's going on, and then the AI, the computer, actually gives you your diagnosis. And you think, well, that's crazy, is it? Because think about it this way. If I have the data from every person that has those same symptoms, if I have data from, from thousands, millions of people, and they all have the similar experiences, and then we can gather that data and say, okay, well, this person did this, and this person did this, and we prescribed this, and we prescribed that, and when we put all of that together and we sift all that out, we find that the best solution to fix this problem is this. That's AI. Because the AI will be able to look at all of those different aspects and be able to pull out the best solution for your particular ailment and be able to provide you with some sort of positive care result. So that's where we're going. That's where we're headed to. And then I'll also take a look at this. So recently we just had the Cures Act. Cures Act is another thing where we're going to be able to say, or actually the government has said, as a healthcare provider, we can't limit you getting to your data. So that means that if you want Apple to get all of your medical data through maybe like an API, we're going to have to be able to provide that to Apple. Now, once that has occurred, what happens to your medical information once you've released it? That's on you. We protect the data while it's within the walls of our building. But once you release that information, that's akin to me giving you all of your paper medical records and then you wallpaper in your house with them. So as we move forward and as you begin to see yourself distributing your medical data more and more into the cloud, and it will happen, I encourage you to also be cautious of who you're giving your information to and what are they doing with that information. So just a, just a note. So that's where we're headed to. And that's where we're going as an as, as a industry. So what does all this have to do with IT? Well, this is, again, your story, right? So there's other dangers that come along with this. And the ransomware, recently we've heard of another medical uh, industry that was recently hit with the ransomware attack. And it was the largest ransomware attack to hit a medical facility or a medical unit in that, that we've ever heard of. And it caused a lot of people to be turned away for, for services based on the fact that the ransomware had hit. And so that's bad. But then also in Germany, you may or may not have heard about this one, we have our first documented homicide as a result of ransomware. In Germany, there was a small organization that got hit with ransomware, and as a result, they had to turn somebody away. They couldn't get service at that particular facility, and on, way to, and on their way to the other facility, the patient passed away. So now the German officials are investigating that as a homicide. That's the first documented case of homicide as a result of ransomware. Now, the people that actually did release that ransomware have come back to say, we're sorry, we meant to hit the school, not the hospital but damage is done. So some of the other dangers of, of medical IT are legacy hardware. So there's this thing called an FDA approval. And the FDA approval means that we have a device that's designed for patient care. We build this thing to provide patient care. And in order to do that, we have it built on this particular OS at this particular patch level, and it does this thing. If you try to patch that, we don't know what the after effects will occur as a result of that particular device being patched. So you're not allowed to patch it. You're not allowed to do anything with it. You use it as it comes, and then we will have to update that version or that software later on. So oftentimes what happens is, is that the vendor is a little uh, lethargic about getting some of those releases done, so we end up with legacy hardware, legacy software. 
Then on top of that, as a result of this legacy hardware, legacy software, we end up with poor security controls. So now we have security controls that are kind of baked into whatever legacy hardware software that we're dealing with that were designed at the time that that operating system and that patch level were there. And as we know, the vulnerabilities are constantly evolving, and so and you have to continue to stay up to date on those patches. And if you can't do that because of an FDA approval, then that causes you to be at a kind of, you kind of have to, you're always on the back foot because you're always trying to figure out, well, how do we, how do we mitigate this? And so in the IT world, we've, we try to protect, we put walls around this equipment and we put it in different environments in order to be able to literally firewall or, or protect these devices from getting, for those that shouldn't be getting access to them. We try to prevent anybody from getting access to it that shouldn't. And, but as an IT professional and as IT professionals, we also want to push back on the vendors and say, look, it's your responsibility to continually update your software and your hardware. So we're constantly pushing back on these vendors to say, we understand where you're coming at from the FDA approval standpoint, but you also have to come forward and let us and give us newer information and newer technology so that we can stay up to date as well. So that's kind of where we stand today in as far as the dangers of medical IT, and there are others, but that's probably the biggest ones that we run up against. And so then I say all that to say, so why healthcare? Why do you want to do healthcare? And healthcare, I, I, I think that it probably sums it up best in this one graphic. This one graphic demonstrates the reason why I'm in healthcare, and it also demonstrates why I feel like that you should be in healthcare as well. And this is, that's a sales pitch, man. I'm going to sell it. And the reason why I'm going to sell it is because we need the help. In, in this industry, we get to help Mrs. Smith walk again. We get to find cures for cancer. We get to, we're working on a cure for COVID. We're working to extend life. We're extending to, to provide better lifestyles. That's why I'm in healthcare and that's why it's so important. When I go home at night, I know that I have contributed to doing something better, that I've contributed to my community and I've, con I've contributed to, to making the world a little bit better. And how this all comes together from an IT perspective. All the things that I've talked about tonight all revolve around IT. Because when the doctor goes into the office, I'll bring it all the way back to the beginning, when I said that, you know, there's no, there's no computers in doctor's offices when I was a kid. Now there are. And when the doctor walks into his office, he turns on the light and he turns on his computer. And just the same as he turns on the light switch, he has no fear that the lights will come on. That same doctor needs to have no fear that that computer will come on. And that computer will have the right data at the right time for the right people. And it's going to be accurate and it's going to be good for use to provide care. And you know what? He's, he's right. And he will have that because this team of IT professionals will always make sure that that computer is on and accurate. And that's why I'm in healthcare because I want to make sure that when I walk home, I have, while I may not ever see a patient, but at the end of the day, I know that I have helped Mrs. Smith walk. I have helped cure cancer. I have helped find a cure for the COVID. I have helped extend life in, in healthcare because that's what we do every day. And that's why you should too. It's not about what, I mean, the other businesses in, in Roanoke and the surrounding area provide great services, but man, where else can you go home at night and be able to say, man, I did something really cool today. I made sure that, this, that people were able to, to live longer lives. And I was able to make sure that we're, we're doing research work, all this stuff. And that's why we can do that here at Carillion and in other facilities. And it doesn't matter whether you work at Carillion or whether you work for the Red Cross or whether you work for um, Centra. It's all the same, man. Whether you work for a nursing home, it's all the same, man. Just get in there. Do it. And I'll end up with this. So how can I help? Jump in. Begin to volunteer. If you want to... The, the, it's a, it's a wide, vast opportunity. So jump in, 
Find opportunities to volunteer. Volunteer at the Red Cross. Volunteer at, at nursing homes. Volunteer at Caribbean. Volunteer at Centra. It may not be in a technical aspect to begin with, but you're going to learn so much if you can just jump in and begin to just understand what it is to have those experiences and what it is to be able to see what actually happens and how computers and how these medical devices interact with the patient and how we get the data out of those systems and insert it into the medical records and where all of that information goes. So that's my first encouragement. Jump in, figure out a way that you can, that you can actually get involved. And the next thing is I'm going to say learn the vernacular. And what I mean by that is that there's opportunities as you volunteer to be able to learn what it is, what, what is HL7, what is all these things that we're talking about. And as B mentioned, HIT 230 or HIT 230 is going to be available. It's computer applications in healthcare. And I encourage you to actually take this class, particularly if you're wanting to do IT in healthcare, because I'm telling you, once you understand what all of these things mean, it's going to mean a, a world of difference when you go in for the job interview, when you can say, oh yeah, I already know about that, or I already understand this. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is that there's plenty of work. Grab a shovel. And what I mean by that is that you're telling me, and I hear this often, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a database guy, or I'm a this guy, I'm a, I'm a agile guy, or whatever. I hear you. We've got room, come on in, right? So it doesn't matter whether you're a database guy, an application guy, a Python guy, a Java guy, whatever it is, we got room for you. And so whatever your major is, if you're in IT, if the, if the, if the end result is something in IT, the medical industry has room for you and will have the opportunity for you. So just come on in, right? Do it and just, and you'll be happier for it. The, the water's fine. Come on in. It'll be great. So that's, that's where I am today. And uh, so that, that kind of wraps it up. And I'm open for questions. I will go ahead and let you know if you want to reach out to me. Uh, this is my contact information. You can reach me at regarvey at coronaclinic.org. Uh, of course, you can always do info at Renwick InfoSec, or my Twitter handle is at Rob Garvey. Uh, so, in uh, Roanoke InfoSec, I'd be remiss if I didn't throw in a little plug for RISE. So check out RoanokeInfoSec.com. That is the local Roanoke Information Security Exchange. We'll be doing some stuff in October and November. Uh, and we're also going to have a B-Sides in May, Lord willing. So uh, check out the website. So with that, I'm all done. So right, anybody have any questions for me? You are so not done, Rob. We have a list of questions for you. Uh, all right. <laughs> We'll just start here at the top. Uh, Dr. Wolf actually asks, we always ask her questions because, you know, membership has privileges. Uh, what steps do computer science, information technology students need to take to be a team member in this? What, what degree, what experience? What experience? That's a great question. So um, depending on where it is that you want to go, I would suggest um, if, if from a degree standpoint, uh, and well, I guess it really depends on what what area do you want to focus in, right? So if I can if I can narrow that down a little bit, an IT degree uh, will will assist. But it, like like I said, it's a wide it's a it's a it's a big pool. So any of the IT genres, if you can call them that, will work. And so I certainly would suggest that there, there's not really one area that you could focus in that would be more impactful than another, I don't believe, as long as you were willing to put in the time. I don't know. Does that answer that question? That's a really good question. <laughs> well, we aim to keep them good. I, yeah, I think it's a good start. Um, we have a few more along that same line. Uh, if someone wanted to enter the healthcare IT field, what kinds of classes do you recommend they take? Is a medical background or knowledge required as well? It's not required. Um, it's not required. What, what I would say is that the classes that you want to take are the one, I mean, I will literally say this this way. Whatever you find interesting to you, whatever you find interesting to you that you feel you can benefit the environment the best. Like, I wouldn't suggest to anybody, and B, you and I already talked about this, I don't suggest to anybody to go into a particular field based on the money or based on whatever the need is. 
do something that you find enjoyable. And if you find that area enjoyable, particularly in healthcare, because we've got room for you, then you're going to do well in that. So don't chase the buck. Chase what what chase your dream. Chase what's actually entertaining to you, and we'll 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 take care of the rest, right? We can find places for you to fit in in the health in the healthcare arena. But I wouldn't suggest any particular like. I mean, an IT degree, and obviously, if you're going to do healthcare, again, the HIT class, the HIT class, and trying to jump in and learn some of this stuff with voluntary and things like that. But um, there's no particular one arena that I would suggest, like, go into database or look for field services or something like that. Does that make sense? Am I still there? Hello? Makes sense to me. Where's B? It's that darn mute. I, I, I hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're gonna, man, I answered that so well, they don't even want me to answer anymore. I was stunned speechless. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, we're going to stay on this for a second. We're going to ask you to go just a little bit deeper down that hole, though. Um, could you expand on your what you know and what your awareness is of jobs that stand at the intersection between um, healthcare data and cybersecurity? So, I, if I'm interpreting this right, think there's the you know there's there's blue teaming uh, and protecting a, a network, but there's also you know the data itself and and all of the policy and management associated with that. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the, the red team, blue team aspect of it, um, the, uh, and, I, and I hope that I unpack this properly. Um, so when it comes to the red team, blue team, there's obviously not a lot of opportunity to do red team type of activities with in the medical industry, unless you're working for some sort of contractor. I mean, it's just not. So I guess maybe that is the one area now I think about it that's probably not as, maybe you don't have as much opportunity. Rob, but I'm going to interrupt you if I can. Uh, just for folks who don't know what red teaming and blue teaming is. Oh, right. Sorry. Some background on that as well. So, all right. So a red team, uh, so yeah, that's a good point. So red teaming would be somebody who does the what we call the penetration testing. They're the guys that are out doing things like trying to attack systems and provide you with feedback. Basically, they're the guys that are that you hire to say, how vulnerable am I? Where do my vulnerabilities exist? And so those are the guys that you're typically gonna pay to come in. The, the, the issue that we have with that in healthcare is uh, there's generally not a big demand for that. There's nobody. There's not a big demand for paying somebody just to sit there and just hack systems all day. And typically, that's going to be more on what's known as the blue team side, which is where the guys that are actually sitting behind the console and watching things occur and preventing those attacks from occurring. So you're going to pay somebody to do penetration testing on you periodically, but as a day-to-day -day role from a cybersecurity standpoint, it's more of what's known as the blue team, which is where we're actually preventing attacks and we're creating those policies and we're creating the environments that prevent those attacks from occurring. So um, let me let me go a little bit further with that actually from a policy standpoint. So if you're one that's really into policy management, that's also a big field because we need that as well because these policies are ever evolving. And so you need to make sure that whatever policy statements that you make that they also map in, in line with whatever the world or whatever's happening in the world, right? So uh, from this aspect of being able to, from the policy management and the, and the blue team side, I think there's tons of opportunity there. And so that's where I would tend to focus my efforts. If you're going to do, if you're looking at cybersecurity in that realm, policies, uh, compliance, that's also a big one, making sure that we're staying compliant, particularly in the IT world. And then also the blue team side, not so much on the red side. So I guess that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Awesome. All right, let's see. Uh, I've got a couple of questions on the same line here. So I'll see if I can combine them. Um, and as long as I've got everybody's attention, uh, I could use lots more questions. This is, it's, we can, I, I hesitate to call him chump, but we can stump the chump. Remember, Rob's got a lot of uh, technical experience as well as just, you know, working and getting people jobs. So if you want to 
I'm going to try to push them down the rabbit hole a little bit. I'm talking to my uh, IT and 60 students now. Uh, feel free to, to, to challenge him. We'll see how he does. Um, all right, so a couple of questions along the same line. Um, internships and partnerships with career. Oh. So uh, that's another good question. So I can't really talk to a lot of that. Um, I, I am a worker bee, not a management guy. So I will tell you what, what I have seen. Uh, we do offer internships, and, uh, but as far as how those work, I don't know. Uh, however, comma, I will make note of that, and I will try to get back to you on that. So is that fair? Is that a fair statement? Now, the other side of that is, is that uh, I'm sure that there will be volunteer opportunities within the Karelian organization. Maybe not in IT, but again, I reach back to the, what I said before. It doesn't always have to be in IT in order for you to get the experience and learn how the environment works. There's nothing wrong with, with doing a little bit of intern work or, or just doing some volunteer work, uh, maybe with the ambulance or, or something like that. Because in the midst of doing that, you're also gonna get the experience of being able to see how those systems interact. You may not be the guy actually with hands on the keyboard, but you will be interacting with those systems from a user standpoint. And that can be just as valuable, really. So, um, and again, it doesn't have to just be with Carillion, right? I mean, there's plenty of other opportunities. There's, there's the Red Cross, there's nursing homes, there's all kinds of opportunities just within the Roanoke Valley so, uh, and, and there beyond. So I wouldn't limit myself just to Carillion. I would look for other opportunities to volunteer and also let them know that, hey, look, I have some IT experience and I'm pretty sure, I know for sure, like uh, the goodwill takes, takes lots of opportunities, it's not really in the medical arena, but just as, a, as an opportunity, I know that these organizations are willing to allow you to flex your muscles a little bit in the volunteer space. So I, I encourage volunteering and particularly with this, uh, within the medical world, absolutely. Um, I'm going to switch things up a little bit because I want the answer to this one. Uh, this actually came from Amy White, but it's one that I'm, I'm curious about too, and feel free to go a little bit down the rabbit hole. Um, as we moved from paper and continue to move in some cases from paper to electronic, um, talk a little bit about the security of medical data, particularly uh, and how those, those migrations have impacted us as we move forward. So it's been an interesting journey. Um, we do what we can. I mean, we, we obviously the idea is to protect the data and to make sure that we are doing everything that we can. So what's particularly interesting is that we it's the same story over and over and over again. And I hate to I hate to put it in simplistic terms, but the same attack vectors that affect a bank also affect us. So poor passwords um, and doing the password sprays and things like that. Uh, are going to be a big attack vector. Poor password management, um, improper patching, same things that affect every other organization affect us the same way. I mean, the, I don't want to suggest that it's not important, but data is data, whether it's electronic medical records or whether it's your grocery list stored on a home PC. We do, what we, we do everything in our power to protect the data. But sometimes it's our own users that put us at, at the biggest risk because we're still at risk of the phishing emails. We're still at risk of a user clicking the wrong link. And we put in all the controls that we can. We have all of the email filters and we do all of these things in order to try to protect the, the user from themselves. But at the end of the day, and, and I'm a user too, so that's not to suggest that I'm some, you know, like I'm high above every other user. I've got a little bit more experience, but I could be, I could fall prey to a phishing email just as much as anybody if it's crafted properly. So I don't for one second expect that I'm better than the average user. I just know that I've got a little bit more experience, just like you probably don't want me performing your heart surgery and maybe you want the heart doctor to do that, right? So the point is, is that getting back to the original question, what are, what are the challenges? Challenges are the same. Um, we, we still deal with phishing emails, we still deal with poor passwords, we still deal with other things that are relatable to most industries, ransomware and things like that. But then on top of that, some of the other things that we run into with the legacy hardware, 
vendor-related issues where they don't want to update certain systems, that also puts us at risk as well. And so we try to do what we can to mitigate those threats and build walls around that. And so things like MFA is probably a big one. Multi-factor authentication is probably a big win and those kinds of things. So without rambling too far, and that I hope that answers the question. Sure, but we're, we're going to keep you rambling because I've got one and then I've got another one that's kind of on the same thing. I want to know what attack vector keeps you awake at night? I have to be careful with this. Um, without without, without uh, un unduly exposing yourself here. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, all right, so in general sense, and truly in a general sense, with no regard to who I work for or anything else, every medical industry will tell you the same thing, right? Ransomware is what keeps me up at night. It really is. Um, because here's the deal. Um, you can recover from poor passwords and... I mean, so there's different aspects to every one of these vulnerabilities that you have to face, and each one presents its own set of problems. But I think the one that probably scares the bejesus out of us, and this is medical industry across the world, is the ransomware. And, and the reason why that is, is because it's so impactful and, the, and it wreaks such overarching damage. And the part that, I can't say the word, that ticks me off is the fact that it's like, it's like an ill regard for patient care. And that's probably the part that just, it just really drives me nuts. And I would be more aggressive with my wording if I could, because it's just the point that, come on, man, like, don't do that crap. Like, this is, this is like life and death situation. Don't, don't pull that crap. That's not funny. It's not cool. It, it, there's just no room for it in my mind. And so that's what keeps me up at night. It's not so much of the, the it's, it's the wide impact. It's the, just the, the impact to patient care. I just don't want that. I don't want that for my organization. I don't want that for any organization, particularly in healthcare, because it's just not cool. I mean, people's lives hang in the balance when you pull that crap, as we've seen in Germany. Somebody died because of this crap. Don't do that. So yeah, that's what keeps me up at night. Sorry, I get a little animated on that one. Oh, that's, that's awesome, thank you. Um, all right, let's see if I can get this one kind of boiled down. Um, we want you to talk a little bit about uh, healthcare database management. Um, in your case, is this done by an EMR like, like Epic or Cerner, or is it you guys? Uh, and how does, how does using the cloud in healthcare, um, and what kind of trends do you see going forward with that? So that's, that's a great question. So we do, and again, I am, I am not an Epic guy, but we do use Epic. So my experience with the way that we use Epic is probably going to be fairly limited. So I'm going to preface it, my statement with just that. But um, we do use Epic, and uh, I couldn't imagine trying to manage that type of environment, particularly with an organization the size of ours, doing it that yourself, like with an access database or a SQL database or something. That would be insanity. So, um, no, we do rely on Epic, and we have a team of Epic developers that basically are modifying Epic daily. Um, we, we, do, we, make, we make modifications based on um, just COVID alone. I mean, we might as well have a just department dedicated just to COVID and how we're doing contract tracing and, and doing all these other things. And so, yes, that's a, that's a huge thing for us. And we do, we do have an on-prem instance. And but Epic does offer a cloud instance, and I have worked for an organization that actually had a cloud EMR. And I'll tell you the differences. So the on-prem, you manage it, you own it, um, and you kind of kind of tuck yourself in bed at night going, okay, well, I know where my data is, and I know that as long as nobody gets into my data center, I'm safe, right? But there's also the aspect of having to care and feed for that, right? So we have to patch it, we have to make sure that their hard drives are well, we have to, so there's a whole maintenance aspect of that. On the flip side of that, you've got a provider that offers it in the cloud. And I've worked for an organization like that, and it was great because basically imagine, so right now all of our, all of our remote offices have to come back to our data center here in Roanoke in order to be able to get medical record data. 
Well, the beautiful thing about it being in the cloud is that if I've got 0365 and I've got my medical records in the cloud, I literally don't even have to have a data center any longer. I mean, if that's the only two things that I'm using, because literally I can just have a cable modem with a firewall at any location, point them to the cloud, and there you go. I'm done. Like, no maintenance, no nothing. I can probably get rid of my IT department. Not really, but the point is, is that it, it certainly simplifies things until we have a network outage or a main or that provider has an outage, at which point that did happen at one point. So not only did we get hit at, at the organization that I worked for, but every other organization that leveraged that same EMR provider also got hit. And so uh, there was an outage related to some sort of upgrade they did or something they kind of went south on them. And as a result, uh, we were without EMR for two days. So in, at that point, you holler at your sales guy, you holler at you know some person that's sitting on some phone somewhere, but I can guarantee you that here with it sitting in the data center, there's gonna be like 10 people poking at somebody and beating them down until we get it back up and running as opposed to some guy that's sitting on a phone somewhere in the cloud that you really have no belly, what I say, you know, there's no belly button to poke at that point. Whereas if it's sitting in your data center, you've got somebody to actually beat on with a stick until something happens. So pros and cons, I've seen it both ways. Uh, let me get you to expand. This is just a personal question on, on that. Expand on it. What about um, co-hosted sites where you have a, a local instance and a cloud instance uh, to deal with those kinds of losses? Is that something anybody's exploring in this field? I really wouldn't know. Um, I know that we've chatted about it, but I'm, I have not been part of those conversations here locally. I know it's a thing, but I really don't have a whole lot of information on that. Sorry, and I, I would not, and I would be remiss if I even attempted to discuss that. I really wouldn't know. That's one of those where I strap on my, my tinfoil hat because I think about, well, if we, if we have, let's say, um, a major outage like we had a couple of weeks ago that took down Cloudflare and, and, and a bunch of their um, providers um, on that knock, um, you know, that was devastating for so many businesses. I would think that in healthcare and other critical situations, some sort of co-locating would make sense. I, it just kind of it just kind of came to mind as you were talking. I think it's interesting that it's not something yeah. I've heard more about. And, and you know, now I think about it, um, I did work for another organization that did co-locate. We actually had a co-location in AT and T data center in Chicago. And it was cool, and it, it, it certainly it certainly makes a difference, right? You co-locate, particularly if you're in an AT and T data center. Um, I mean, you're there. You're you're like you're on the internet. You're you're literally there on the internet. So you're on the backbone, literally. And so uh, there's there's advantages to that. Plus, being able to store some additional data. So there's some advantages there. But what I do know, at least back then. That's not a cheap proposition. I mean, anytime you're kind of running this hybrid environment between on-prem and cloud, that's that's a very expensive proposition. You're not going to, it's it's kind of like, in, in my experience, and again, it's one guy, right? But in my experience, living in a co, in a hybrid environment, half cloud, half on-prem, that's gonna eat your lunch when it comes to the checkbook. So move one way or the other. But I get it. I mean, there's some situations where it makes sense to do the hybrid thing, but man, that's a, that's an expensive proposition because you're paying twice. You're paying for on-prem and you're paying for the cloud. So, you know, it's it's, a, it's an expensive proposition. Yeah, well, we may, uh, we may go down that rabbit hole of expense versus life at some point, but probably not right now. We've got a few questions now queued up that are probably a little lighter at heart. Um, some questions about telehealth. Well, let me see if I can kind of squish some of these together a little bit. Um, a couple of questions about telehealth, all kind of on the same line. Of, uh, we all thought telehealth was going to really take off this year. I mean, certainly the presence of COVID um, has has pushed movement in those ways. Um, but uh, I've got a student here, and I, I tend to agree. I'm not sure I've really seen it to the level we thought we would. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, Carillion's telehealth system and what you know about it, at least, and and yeah, so we've seen a we've seen a huge increase actually. Um, and in fact, we're all for it. 
quite honestly. Um, we, we love telehealth. We think it's a fantastic opportunity because it extends us beyond the perimeter of, the, of this particular surrounding area. And again, getting back to the patient care aspect of it, now you're not limited. You don't have to drive. I mean, outside of COVID, right? Outside of COVID situation. If, I'm, if, if, if there's a patient that needs some sort of specialized care, whether it's mental care, like psychological care, whether it's physical care, in the past, we had to drive 45 minutes to get to that particular location to see that particular specialist. Well, now with compression rates and being able to do what we can do, and we've, we've really made a hard push to continue to advance our telehealth kind of environment because we really feel like that it's a, it's a way to go because we can extend our health, we can, we can extend how we're caring for our patients so much further down the line. So now we're not required for somebody to drive 45 minutes in to see a particular specialist. Now we can have that face-to-face -face patient visit and never have to leave your home. And sometimes think about the environment, particularly with maybe like uh, mental issues where you know they don't want to leave their house, right? Now they don't have to. We can talk them through those types of situations. So the, the, the ability to provide healthcare is amazing. Additionally, let's think about home health. We have nurses that provide home health care, like, like your uh, hip replacement, right? So that we have nurses that go to the home to help you, assist you in, in recovering from whatever, whatever surgery or whatever thing that you're recovering from. And they have the ability to be able to remote in and be able to take diagnostics and do those things. And again, maybe not so much telehealth as much as being able to directly connect into our systems quickly and efficiently to be able to get feedback and be able to provide a health care outcome that, that allows this person to be able to walk sooner and recover quicker. So yeah, all of these things are positive. And quite honestly, um, you may not see it because you know we, we haven't seen a lot of the advertisements for it, or maybe you haven't seen it like you would have thought you had. But from our aspect, particularly when we went right into the lockdowns and we weren't allowed to do elective surgeries anymore, and we were really restrictive on how we could communicate with our patients, telehealth really launched. And it maybe has dropped off some, but I'm telling you, uh, I'm on the tele telehealth bandwagon myself, and I think it's a great thing, and I and I encourage that largely just because of what it can do to help our patients. So any special challenges from a from an IT standpoint with telehealth? Absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, the, the bandwidth issue is probably the biggest one. Um, internet connectivity is a big one, and then from a security standpoint, it's it's the typical. How do we secure the communications, making sure that we're using the right vendors, making sure that we're using the right protocols, making sure that we're sending the data to the right place. And, you know, it's the same thing for the IT security guy all the time. It's, it's the mantra that I live by, making sure the right people get the right data at the right time. And so that's what we have to deal with. And whether it's telehealth or whether it's anything, it's the same story. But particularly with telehealth, you have to make sure that when we're creating these communication streams, that we're doing that in the right way making sure that we're not allowing anybody to, to hijack that session or anything else. And so you have to be really you have to be really conscious about who you're partnering with because you're going to partner with somebody and you want to make sure that you're partnering with the right companies and the right right vendors to make sure that you're doing it properly. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You got to make sure that you're doing it the right way. All right. And, and on that, um, and this may be a little above your pay grade, but you can perhaps speculate. Um, we know that around our area, we, we have some rural areas that are still struggling with broadband. We know that we have doctor's offices in one of those areas. Um, any thoughts on that problem, how Carillion is, is involved in that, if at all? I really don't know about that. Um, I know that we constantly look for ways that we can extend our services out to those areas. But I'm not sure. I'm not. I would not be familiar with any type of partnership arrangements or anything that we have with providers or what we're doing to allow that to occur now. Um, no comment. Let's see what else? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you end up where you are now? So that's a great question, and I love to talk about myself. So how long you got? Uh, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, I started out uh, in IT. I was actually kind of a funny story. I was a bill collector for MBNA America. And uh, while I was working there, I had an opportunity to go work because I had an Air Force background. I had an opportunity to work in aircraft lending. And while I was in aircraft lending, um, a couple of the computer guys there, we drank coffee and we would chat every morning. And they decided that they thought I was a cool guy and they asked me to join their IT team. And then that started my IT journey. And through the course of events, I ended up um, bouncing around a couple of different companies there for a little while, and then ended up at the night vision plant here in Roanoke for about 15 years. And during that time, I had served in several different roles um, and ended up primarily while doing a lot of server work and switch for you know, network engineering. My, my claim to fame there was we went through the um, what was it, the, the lawsuit or the DOJ thing? It was literally the day that they came in, the DOJ, ICE, and a bunch of other three-letter organizations came in in the black vans and black SUVs, stormed in the door and said, we're here to take all of your data, we're here and we need to talk to these people. And that literally was the day I started my IT security career because um, and we can, you can look this up, look up ITT night vision, um, what was it, I can't remember what it was now, but it was years ago, but basically we got fined a hundred million dollars and this is crazy nonsense. But nonetheless, but I, that's where I got started and I ended up moving over to the classified network side because there was some assistance needed there and I ended up doing classified data work for the night vision plant here in Roanoke. And I did that for quite a while and built that program out pretty good. And then a buddy of mine asked me if I'd like to make a move. And at that time, ITT had already gone through some several changes from Excellus to Harris and a couple of other things. And so I felt like it was a good chance for me to move. So I moved over to an ambulatory care facility that took, it was a mid-tier medical organization. I had never done medical work in my life. It was largely nursing homes and rehabilitative care. And I worked in that facility for about, I worked for that conglomerate for about a year. And the only disadvantage that I had there was that I was working for a really good friend. And I'll tell you just as advice, never work for a friend. Um, it's, it's, it's just probably not a great idea. And so while he and I are still friends today, it just wasn't a great working environment for me because I really liked the guy and it was really difficult for me to disappoint him on so many different occasions. No, I'm just kidding. But in any case, um, it just felt like a better switch. So I had an opportunity to move over to Carillion about three years ago. And that's how I got to where I am. What I found, the reason why I was able to make the transition over to medical was because this was right after the Anthem hack. And I should have put this in the presentation. Um, if you guys remember, there was an Anthem hack that happened maybe four or five years ago that put everybody on edge, particularly because of HIPAA violations. And all of a sudden, there was this mad rush to get as many IT security professionals into the door at medical facilities and medical organizations as they could. And what they found was that, most people found was that if you stole them from government agencies, it was kind of cool because they already understood structure and they already had some sort of understanding of the security boundaries and how to make things fit within a particular mold. So the idea was that you would extrapolate what you learned from the DOD side and kind of put it into the HIPAA environment. And it sort of worked. Um, I uh, was able to take some of that, but largely HIPAA is a different beast than what anything I did in the DOD. So it's a, it's a lot different. It's been a lot of fun and uh, learned a whole lot in the, in the time that I've been here. So. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, quick one, how are you handling employee security awareness training and tracking? In-house, outsourced, something else? Oh, we do that largely in-house. We have our HR department and our compliance team takes care of most of that. Um, we do some in-house training with just our TSG, what we call our technical services group internally, but um, largely that gets handled through our uh, HR department and our compliance team. We are looking to expand that a bit. And uh, I think one of the biggest wins that we've had recently is 
um, performing internal phishing campaigns and teaching people how to recognize internal uh, recognize phishing campaigns and when somebody's attempting to get your information. But you know, we have all the typical things that most organizations do when it comes to the uh, to the IT security awareness training, and we try to try to hold certain events. We're looking at something obviously uh, this month is security awareness, so we're looking to hold something this month and try to educate further on that. So a lot of in-house stuff. Um, I'm looking for a job entry level in IT. College actually pays worse than entry level IT. Um, so if I walk through your door, um, what's the first thing you're gonna hope that I demonstrate? Is a, is a knowledge, skill, and ability? I'm wearing the right kind of tie. What's what's the first thing that really rings your bell? So my first question is, what are you applying for? Again, it's a wide scope, right? So um, depending on, particularly for entry level, so I'll kind of play this out a couple of different ways. So. Um, you've got the entry-level guy that wants to get into the organization, and we see this a lot. And this is probably the most common path if you if you just want to work for Carillion, right? You want to work for IT, Carillion IT. This is the most common path that we've seen, and it's actually it's worked out fairly well. But you're going to get a job on the help desk, uh, and particularly if uh, if you don't have a large breadth of experience or maybe you don't have a college degree, uh, you're going to get, uh, you're probably going to end up on the help desk. In some cases, uh, we'll make exceptions for that based on whatever the need is, but, but for the most part, the best place to start, particularly for a younger individual, the TSC, our, what we call our technical services group, um, our, our, our help desk, you're going to start there and there's a path. We actually have paths established, like you, you, you got to kind of pay your dues on the help desk. But then once you've done that, then you can look for multiple opportunities as they present themselves and you just apply and you'll get on an entry level position, maybe an application analyst or maybe with the uh, field services team or maybe client systems or one of these other teams. And, and I've seen this like in the past three years, I've constantly seen us move these folks through the help desk and into these other positions. So that's a great place to start. And what am I looking for? Well, if you're doing that, I'm looking for somebody that's got a, realistically, I'm not looking for, well, I am looking for technical aptitude and I'm looking for people that understand technology and maybe how things work. But what I'm really looking for is I'm looking for somebody that's, that's a go-getter, that when I know that I give you something to do, you're gonna get it done. And I'm going to try to make sure that that I'm going to give every opportunity to the guy that excels and shows to himself that he can he can do exactly what he's told and get the job done. Then that's the guy that's going to get the next level job. So, uh, realistically, in our environment, if you're looking for a particular job, let's say network security, then I'm going to look for certain skills and aptitude in that as well. So it largely depends on what you're going for. So I know that doesn't really answer the question. But I do want you to understand there is a trajectory that you can get on, and that's through the help desk. If you just want to just if you're just going to nail a job just in IT at Carillion, if you want to be a little bit more focused, then you can certainly work toward just getting for a particular job. Let's say that you really want to do client systems, you're going to wait for that opportunity and interview for that, and obviously you're going to look for skill sets associated with that particular job function. So does that make sense? I mean, absolutely. That, 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 okay. a wonderful answer. So we're, we're, I'm thinking from from the standpoint of so many of our um, graduates have two years of school, but they get into that. Um, you must have five years of experience um, hole where you're in that circle where you can't get the experience because nobody wants to hire you because you don't have five years of experience. Um, again, thinking at that entry level, is is that the case in healthcare typically, or there are is there an expectation that those help desk employees yeah. already have several years of experience? Yeah, I, and I hate that, but I, I also kind of understand it. So let me kind of tell you where that's coming from. Now, sometimes it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, I see the job postings. Entry level security guy has to have a CISSP and um, you know an OSCP, right? And you're like. 
what planet are you on? Who wrote this job description, right? So I get that. So barring that kind of environment. So when you walk in, in I think that I'm, I'm kind of going to go back to the help desk environment. I think that it's all based around where you want to start. So for us, I've never seen, or maybe I've just never been brought, it's never been brought to my attention. I've never seen a job description like that at Carillion. I think that they, we work hard to try to make sure that the, the job description fits the position. So for instance, like in our IT security department, we don't really have an entry level position. We have security engineers. And so while we may, so any job description that's for a network security engineer is gonna have certain criteria that maps to that particular experience level. So if we were to have an analyst position, we would not be looking for somebody that has five years of experience because number one, I'm not gonna keep you for longer than six minutes because as soon as you find another opportunity, you're gonna take it. So I'm looking for the guy, if I'm looking for an entry level guy, I'm looking for the guy fresh out of college that's looking to make a name for himself and is looking to do, and literally, you're doing the grunt work, man. You're looking eyes on glass 24 seven, maybe not 24 seven, but at least eight, 840, right? Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. And it's going to suck for you. I'm not even going to lie. Because that's the analyst role in an IT security environment. Your eyes on glass, watching little blips on the computer. But the good news is, is that we're going to escalate you as you continue to progress and you're going to move forward. But that's kind of the way it works. And so that would be in the same position as any of these jobs, these entry level jobs. So how do you get around this whole five years experience thing? I really don't have a good answer for that other than um, if you can get around it by just getting the experience and trying to do that volunteer work and trying to, and, you know, I, I don't want to say fudge it, but almost fudging it to the point where you can say, well, I've got five years experience. Well, how'd you get that five years experience? Well, I volunteered for the Red Cross for this many years and I did this and this. And you kind of can speak to those things. That's a good way. That's an end around on that, some of those. But at the end of the day, it's a really difficult thing to challenge, and I and, and I hate it. I do. I, I'm not a big fan of that. So I hear you. I feel your pain, and uh, I, I really can't. It sucks. I don't know. That's not a great answer, but that's the truth. Oh, well, I mean, but that's what we need. We need we need the truth, right? We, we don't need to be surprised when we put our feet out on the side. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up with one final leading question, and hopefully you'll you'll hear where I'm taking you on this. Um, so I'm a student in college. I'm looking for ways to learn more about IT, about security, about the things going on in the world. Um, any clubs, organizations, opportunities locally? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so yeah, um, so RernickInfoSec.com is a great place to start. Um, but there's also others. So, you know, there is a website out there called Ronick Doesn't Suck. And I encourage you, I think it's RonaDoesn'tSuck.com. And uh, there's another guy out there, and, and I, I always kid because his name is uh, Daryl Little. And he runs about five different organizations in Rona. And it's uh, Note Codes. He runs Note Codes. He runs the Unix group. He runs a SQL group now. And I always tell him, you know, like I asked him to do something. He said, well, I would, but I have this nasty idea that I like to sleep sometimes. And so... Um, he's, he is also running various groups. So I encourage you to check out nokecodes.org, I think is what it is, nokecodes.org, roanokeinfosec.com, RBTC, the RBTC, the Roanoke Business Technology Council is a great organization and uh, they do a lot of things, more cybersecurity oriented. Uh, they, they have a lot of subgroups, so there's a lot of subgroups within that organization. So there's tons of things, uh, like I said, the Unix group, um, there's an amateur radio group, not that has anything to do with IT, but I mean, there's tons of organizations that offer lots of experience and can talk to mentors and try to, uh, try to work within these organizations. And, and the best part about it is, particularly with RISE, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to get, to get a mentor, but it's also a great opportunity to talk to the folks that actually may be in leadership positions to be able to, you know, you kind of begin to affiliate with them. They have a job opening. Hey, I remember this guy from a RISE meeting. We talked really well. He's probably worth a shot. 
those kinds of things. So anytime you can start to rub elbows with others within the organization, particularly in the community, once you get your name out there and people know who you are, finding a job's not that difficult. It really is. And, you know, you, people, it, it's a shame, but it's the truth. It's not always what you know, it's who you know. And this is a great opportunity for you. So take advantage of it if you can. So, again, check out Note Codes, check out Vernick InfoSec, RBTC. Uh, there's a robotics club. I mean, that would fall right into clinical engineering, robotics. Um, and then the Unix environment, I mean, the, the SQL, there's a ton of them. So just look for them. And, if you, and again, reach out to me. I will be happy to lead you to any group that you want because I'll just point you right to Daryl Little and he'll know exactly so where to go. Daryl's doing them all, so we'll just give you his email address. Yeah, we'll just um, give you his email address. And so, and he's, in fact, uh, he's probably the next guy that you want to do the next presentation because he could probably talk circles around me. He's much smarter than I am. So for those of you wondering how to get all those things he just named, uh, if you go to virginiawestern.edu slash cybersecurity, you will see a groups and organizations. Um, ah. They don't have quite all of those on there. I'm missing a couple, but I'm, I'm close. So do go there and get involved. Um, I, I have just been astounded at how many opportunities there are in Roanoke to get involved in, in all manner of IT. Um, and yeah, and... Go ahead. I, I'm, I, well, I, I'm just going to say, because, you know, hearing it from the teacher is one thing, but hearing it from a complete stranger somehow means something. So I'm just going to reiterate that he's absolutely right. Like, listen to what B's telling you. You cannot ever, like, going to school, getting, getting the grade, that's all fantastic. Getting to know people will be so much, I mean, it's not more valuable because, you know, I can't say that. But what I can say is that it's very valuable, very valuable. Do it. Learn to uh, go see these other organizations. Rub elbows with these guys because once I'm telling you, run us a small community. Once you get your name out there and people know who you are, it doesn't take long for people to go, "Oh yeah, I know Bob. Yeah, he was at this thing. Oh yeah, I saw him over here last week at this thing." And all of a sudden, you know, man, he's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, well, you know, I got this job opening. Oh really? Well, I talked to Bob last week, and all of a sudden, you're in, you're hired. It's crazy. And I'm telling you, that's the way to do it. Network, man. It's, it's how it's done. And remember, Sorry, that, didn't mean to steal your thunder. No, <laughs> and, that's, and remember, guys, that's what Doug Anderson told you that first week we had our first one as well, that you really have to do other things besides just your classes and that. Exactly right. you got to meet the right people. And we it's talk an investment. It's an investment. It's an investment like any other investment. It's a time investment that will pay dividends beyond your wildest dreams. And, and ask people that, that, that you know, not, not the local 18-year-olds at the burger shop, but people with career um, that have been doing it for a couple of years. Ask them how they got their job. And what you're going to find out is more often than not, they're going to tell you, well, I was qualified. I did these things to get it. But ultimately, it's because I knew this person or I had this recommendation or I went through this channel. I know that every job of value I've ever had um, came because I knew people um, who wanted me there, um, whether I was really qualified or not. Because um, there's a lot to be said for dealing with a known quantity. So, you know, and you're exactly right. And that's exactly how I got, how I moved. Like, I didn't want to leave ITT slash Excellus slash Harris slash whoever they are today. I didn't want to leave them. Uh, but when my buddy comes to me and says, hey, man, you want to come work for me? And I'm like, heck, yeah, I want to come work for you. And then I realize, heck, no, I don't want to work for you. But nonetheless, I mean... I, it, out of the blue, I get a phone call, come make a transition. So, and that launched me on the healthcare aspect of it. So, I mean, that's the way it works, man. And so it's, it's, it sucks. It's the way it is. And that's the real world. All right, Rob, we got three minutes. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. All right. Cause we, we kind of talked a little about this offline. So, um, every morning you get up and you want to go to work, more or less, you kind of, kind of said that. Not or work from home, depending. <laughs> what, what is it about working in healthcare specifically that makes you want to be there and do that job? So, literally, every project and everything, every task, I mean, every change we make, I'm not, I'm not joking, this is not a lie, this is the God's honest truth. 
every change we make, every project we start, everything that we do, there's one question that gets asked before we ever get started. How will this impact patient care? And that, I think, sums up the reason why I want to work at Carillion or in healthcare is because it's all about impacting patient care. Every day, I cure cancer. I help cure COVID. I help Mrs. Smith walk again. I help with hip replacements. I make sure that a doctor can find a, a new drug that does something brand new. That's me. Like, did I actually do any of that work? Heck no, but did, did me and the team that I work with provide the platform and the foundation to make that happen? Gosh, right, we did. And that's cool, man, because it's not about just making the next buck, hitting the next quarter, and seeing how much money I can make for the stockholders. Heck no. This is all about making sure that somebody sitting in a hospital room can continue to breathe or can, can make the next wedding anniversary. I mean, that's why. It's not about money here. It's not. Every time we get together and we start a new project, I'm not kidding you, the first question is, what will this do to patient care? That's the organization I want to work for. That's the group that, that I think is saying something. Because it's not about money. It never was about money. It never has been about money. Money is, a, is an end to a means. I mean, we require it to be able to, so what do we do with profits? We reinvest them. We build another building. And I know that Roanoke is, I mean, literally, if you go down, I guess it's Franklin Avenue, like I think you can walk from RMH all the way to community and never take your foot off of Carillion property. And I know that drives a lot of people crazy, like, man, we're taking over Roanoke. Well, we are, but for good reasons. Because every one of those buildings is providing care to somebody, and we're extending that care beyond just this community into other areas. So yeah, that's the reason why I'm doing it. I think that went beyond three minutes. I'm sorry. No, that that's would. Right. And I'm hoping I'm hoping everybody, all of our students, can get jobs and be that passionate because that's really, I mean, that's that's life. It's great stuff. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it really is. It's it's. There's a lot worse places to work. Right. I mean, and am I going to tell you, I mean, and I'm going to go over here just for a minute, but am I going to tell you that working for Korean is like, oh, like, you know, roses and unicorns? No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. There are days I go home and I'm like, you know, I want to just throw the computer in the trash and say, I never want to do this again because that's, that's life. That's being an adult. But at the end of the day, when you really look at it from a holistic work of, uh, you know, a holistic work, of what I've invested, as opposed to the 15 years that I invested in, in ITT Night Vision, which was great work. I mean, providing night vision goggles to soldiers and being able to go through the Iraq war and doing all that things, that was fantastic. And I really felt like I was doing something impactful. But how much more do I feel like it now that I'm actually directly impacting patient care every single day? So yeah, it's, it's, I'm pretty passionate about it. Great. Um, I, I have no idea how to close. That's pretty much the best I could hope for. Um, Amy, anything to share? You're muted. So we're just watching your lovely face move your lips. Nothing's coming out at all. There it is. It would not unmute. Um, my husband wishes I would stay muted. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was awesome. And, and students, if you don't take anything else away, take away that passion. And, and find a job that you care that much about. Um, that is just the secret to life, in my opinion. So thank you for the work that you do, Rob. Thank you for spending the night with us. And everyone have a great evening. Thank you, right. and You guys Diane. have a good night. Yeah. Rob, thank, thank you so you. much. And yeah, uh, no problem. Thank you. Doing great. Keep an eye out for it. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Everybody.